welcome back finally to the physiology of singing, and singing, and singing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> I just got over a cold that I had for like, ugh, it lasted way longer than it should have. It's a really bad cold and flu season right now. So, yay, if you hear me sniffling a little, it's still raining. I also got new lighting, which you might notice on my glasses here. They're kind of, I went with the most basic thing I could for people who wear glasses. Um, Cause at one point I got one of those ring lights and then when you wear glasses, those are not great because you just end up with the giant ring on your eyes, um, on your glasses lens and then you can't even see my eyes anymore. So, but I got the new lighting so that hopefully I can record more in the evening or at night because days are shorter now and I usually record just using daylight and that's part of why it would take me forever sometimes to get a video out because if it happened to get dark before I could get it done well okay so now I got new lighting yay um excited about that so it's time to get into the tongue oh my gosh you guys uh, ooh, the tongue is actually kind of a hard thing to talk about but I'm going to do two separate tongue videos. I'm going to unpack it two different ways because as a singer, when I was training as a singer, I remember hearing about the tongue in two different settings, okay? One setting would be if I'm with a diction coach or a conductor or maybe even my voice teacher at the time, if they were talking about my diction. So like, oh, you need to do a real Italianate vowel there or oh, that vowel is too open or too closed or what's your tongue doing, you know, right? So they, we would get into the vowels. Um, and then I also heard it about like, mm, sounds like your root of the tongue is a little tight. I would hear that sometimes, right? Yeah, hmm, root of the tongue tension, root of the tongue tension. And I'd be like, well, okay. So I wanna unpack those two different concepts and I think it'll be better done in two separate videos. So this is gonna be root of the tongue video. Root of the tongue, woo! And what are we talking about when we get into that? Um. Let me go to my handy dandy, handy dandy folks, book. Aha! Uh, once again, this there is a newer edition out. So if you're a recent speech pathology student and you had to purchase this textbook, you probably purchased one that looked a little different. But yeah, preclinical speech science. It just has such great images in there, and I could like do slides and like editing and stuff. But ha, huh, who am I kidding? It would take me so long to get that done. I'm just, I don't know, you guys. Okay, so this is where right-left issues become a problem. Hold up. Let me get myself oriented here. If I go this way, okay. Ha <laughs> ha, I gotta think in opposites. Not my strong suit. All right, so we're looking at a side view, of course. This is the mid-sagittal, so essentially if somebody went and like this, and then looked at me this way, that's exactly the view we're looking at. Um, just taking a view here. So you're gonna see where the tongue is, um, all that stuff. So you have a few different ways here. I mean, don't worry about this one right here. This isn't the one. We're not gonna worry about that one. The cutaway oblique front view. Eh. It is kind of cool though. I mean, you get to see sort of the three dimensionality of like the tongue parts and this is the, the throat, the pharyngeal cavity back here. Um, this is a nice color view. Um, you can see the lips here, the nose. Uh, other landmarks would be the mandible. This would be the mandible bone here, so your jawbone. Uh, this would be your maxilla, so your essentially what makes up all this up here. Okay. <laughs> um, epiglottis back there. This is your soft palate right there. I've already done a video on the soft palate, so feel free to go reference that if you'd like to hear about this function into the nasal cavities, into up into the nasal cavities. Ooh, I feel like one of those meteorologists, and I don't know how they do it when they like point to things and it's going different ways. You're not looking. Anyway, um, so epiglottis down here. Woo, I'm not getting my finger in the right place. There it is. Epiglottis here. Um, and if we come down, actually, this is the image we're really going to look at is this black and white one this shades of gray. And you can see that that whole thing there is the tongue. Okay, that whole dark gray, black region is the tongue that we're talking about. It's big. Take that in a second. Look at it rel relative to the mandible. 
I mean, it's a pretty big structure, right? It's going your entire mouth. It's going into your pharynx. The root of the tongue is back here in your pharynx. It's essentially the front wall of your pharynx, which is why we're going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it more relative to laryngeal function. So it might be good to review like lowering of the larynx and laryngeal function. If you'd like to go review those videos, feel free to do so. All right. If you can <laughs> fast forward through some of my babbling for the information you need. All right. So other landmarks. This guy right here, this little guy right here, this is the hyoid bone. This would be the thyroid cartilage right there, and this is the cricoid cartilage, the front part, essentially. This part right here that you can touch is right there. So this is the larynx. So that's how close all these structures are. This is larynx, epiglottis, voleculae, the little space between the epiglottis and the tongue, and then root of the tongue, right there. Pharyngeal wall is like right back there, right? Let's take a look right here. You can see the pharyngeal wall right there. So that's how close all this structure is, okay? Um, which is why one can influence the other pretty easily, you know? All right. So what I'm not going to do is go into a whole bunch of the muscles of the tongue. Not going to see that on this video. If you really would like to learn about the five extrinsic muscles and the five intrinsic muscles of the tongue and exactly what those muscles happen to do and how they happen to shape it, Go to Wikipedia, Wikipedia, the human tongue, Google the human tongue. You're going to be able to find lists of each muscle and what they do. Okay. I don't want to talk about it that way though, because as a singer, and I've seen this online, there are singers out there. There are singers with blogs on my old blog. I did this too, where it's like, we get into talking about what individual muscles should be doing. So we talk about, I'm going to take like genioglossus. Okay. Genioglossus is a huge extrinsic muscle of the tongue. It's involved in dang near everything the tongue does. Okay. It's like this, it's pretty big. Okay. It's fan shaped. Um, all right. So you can go and you can find singer blogs of talking about the genioglossus. And if the genioglossus is overactive this way, then this is what will result. And singers need to work on this and that with the genioglossus. And here's the thing. Back when I was training uh, to be a singer, like during my graduate programs and after and all through the years, all the decades that I did voice lessons regularly, um, if somebody had told me like, so you see what you're doing there? Your genioglossus is overactive. You need to do this with your genioglossus. Do you feel that difference? Do you feel that? Gene That's it. I want the genioglossus more like that. That would have been an opportunity for me to literally be the student who's going, uh-huh, yeah, sure, smile and nod. Mm -hmm. When really in reality, right, like how many times have we had those moments in voice lessons? Yeah, totally. It's, I totally know what you're talking about with my genius glasses. I really feel that. That's okay. And it's like actually what I'm doing is taking maybe like a better inhale I'm taking a deeper breath. I'm like chilling myself out more, you know, for the second try. It's like I'm doing something else really because I don't exactly know what this voice teacher is wanting from me. But I'm like, I know that I didn't take a big enough breath, so I guess I'll do a bigger breath this time. And I just won't tell them that that's what I actually did. I'm going to tell them, yeah, it was totally, yeah, I totally got control over that genie of glasses. That's what I did. Yeah. Okay. Like, truth time, voice students. How many times does that happen? Right? Voice teachers all excited over a change, and you're like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I totally just took your advice. Uh -huh. You know, seriously, right? So, let's help you unpack, because quite frankly, those little moments of, yeah, that was great, and you going, yeah, okay, great, those don't actually stop as you go along voice training. The only difference is, is you need to be able to translate what that person seems to be wanting from you into something that you can do. So that's the whole point of this with the tongue. And that's the whole point of all these videos really is for you to be able to unpack your own technique and think, okay, this person's hearing this, they're mentioning root of the tongue. So they must be hearing this. Therefore for me, that means this, I need to work on this, you know, and that's all. And then that person thinks they're a genius because they gave you genius advice, but really, you know, you're the genius. You're the one who was like, I know how to handle my own singing and I know how to change up what I need to do. Yeah. Right. All right. But then you just smile and nod because usually those people are way more in charge than you are. So still smile and nod, you know, just, just internalize your genius. Just, yeah, I'm a smart singer. I'm really smart. 
Okay. <laughs> Pro tip. <laughs> Don't tell the conductor they're not a genius. Just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Genius conductor. That was the most brilliant advice I've ever gotten about a vowel ever in my life. That just fixed everything for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do, yeah. <laughs> Do that, but with better acting. Okay. Less sarcasm. You can tell why I'm not really singing anymore. <laughs> I'm too good at sarcasm. Okay, so root of the top. It is the anterior wall of your pharynx, okay? Oh, sorry, total side note, back to it. Why are we not going into the genioglossus stuff, all these individual muscles? So the way your tongue functions is it functions like a muscular hydrostat, which is a really fancy way of saying, essentially it functions like a water balloon or like one of those gel stress balls that people like to, you know, you get at like conferences and stuff and sometimes you end up squeezing like, oh. Um, which means if you ever filled up a water balloon and then like squeeze one in and the other end kind of goes out, like, you know, you squeeze the side and, okay. Tongue works like that. So if I want to point out my, if I want to stick my tongue out, okay, genioglossus is involved for sure because something has to contract in order to push the other part of the tongue out, okay? So... One tongue's acting like for you when you're squeezing the water balloon, that's what your muscles are doing. Essentially some muscle or some combination of muscles or some part of a single muscle is squeezing off one part of the tongue so that the other part of the tongue bulges and moves to somewhere else. And that's literally how your tongue is coordinated. It's pretty, pretty awesome that your brain is able to coordinate that. Exactly how neurologically that happens, it's still a little bit of a mystery because there's a lot of challenges to studying that, but it's it's quite an extraordinary thing that your body can coordinate that sort of movement with 10 different muscles, uh, different parts of different muscles even, uh, for speech and for chewing and for swallowing and for everything, okay? It's extraordinary. But what does that mean for the root of the tongue? Let's get into that, Okay. So root of the tongue is that area in the back, like right, I told you. So like we saw, sorry, I want to show my like not so zitty cheek, if that's possible. I don't even wear makeup. I, it's not like I really care. So you can go to these guys. Woo, big deal. Big whoop. All right, anyway. So it's like back in here, okay? And it's like kind of back in this area. It kind of crosses over the mandible a little bit because this is, it doesn't look like I'm super far back. But actually, if you get back here, this is spine area. <laughs> so... It doesn't look super far forward when you get to like kind of where the back of your mandible is, okay? But like this is like my, my mandible, my uh, temporomandibular joint is like right here. So everything back here, I'm like talking like spine and stuff, okay? Your neck has a lot of other important things in it. <laughs> mm, especially the spine. Spine's pretty darn important. Uh, your cer cervical, your cranial nerves and your cervical area. It's all very important. I guess the cranial nerves aren't really in your neck neck, but anyway, point being, don't mind my fluffy pants. <laughs> I'm comfortable at home right now. Anyway, so uh, root of the tongue's that guy back there. It's the anterior wall of your pharynx, which if you've seen any of my other videos, that might be sparking some ideas in your head of where I'm going for with this. So the pharynx is the upper airway. Uh, you, it's part of the vocal tract. Um, it's, you know, the air column above the vocal folds, essentially. You do have a superglottic area, but your, your tongue is essentially right there, you know, with your pharyngeal wall. So when people say root of the tongue, tension, what are they normally talking about? Nine times out of ten, and I think this is true for speech pathologists as well, nine times out of ten, they're talking about some kind of sound quality. There's a voice quality that occurs that's over darkened. Singers would say over darkened or too much oscuro. Okay. It's, um, it sounds a little muffled. It sounds over covered. You might hear that too from singing world. Essentially they'll sound kind of like this and maybe they'll talk like kind of funny if it's really extreme. I'm kind of extremely pulling my tongue back in my mouth right now. So, uh, my entire sound has shifted and my pitch is not actually dropping, but the tongue, base of the tongue is going back and that's created this really dark resonance. Ah, I'm going to stretch because that did not feel great. It didn't feel great to do long term. Um, <laughs> but 
I think this is where base of the tongue tension comes in for a lot of singers, particularly classical singers, because classical singers are really interested in developing this dark sound, this oscuro, right? And we have this chiaro from the singer's formant, so we need that kind of sound. And I feel like, at least in my experience, a lot of belters are more obsessed with the chiaro and more obsessed with the singer's formant, that ring, that zing, that ping, hey, Ethel Merman and whatnot uh, kind of thing. Um, because that gives the sense of power to their voice and it makes their voice carry just as it does opera singers. But there's definitely a sound quality there for musical theater um, and for a lot of belting, you know, gospel, like all these singers, they have this amazing, like, um, like obviously Patti LuPone has it, but oh, who is singing? Patti LaBelle. I was listening to one of her YouTubes the other day, like from the 90s and like, that woman's got some chiaro, folks. She's got some singer's formant. And she's like, she's got a beautiful, rich tone anyway, but she carries that sound. Oh my gosh, it's so powerful, right? It sounds really like powerful, yeah, because it's just ringing out, right? So belters definitely want that for sure. And, um, but, but classical singers, I think, are the ones, especially young classical singers, when you're like an undergrad voice major, you get really obsessed with developing a rich sound, a nice, rich, ooh, kind of sound, you know, right? Because um, you're like 20 something and you don't want to sound like a little babby, like opera singer, right? You want to sound like this, like you're ready to step on the Met, man. And all those Met people, they're like in their 30s and over. And so all those like superstars, right? Not all of them, but you know what I, you know what I mean. And then you're like, oh, I need to sound like them, oh, you know. Yeah, I'm a baby like Spinto or whatever, right? <laughs> so, um, been there, done that. We all wanted a darker, bigger voice than we had when we were younger. Even those with bigger voices still want bigger voices. So it's like grass is always greener in the classical world. But nonetheless, uh, usually people, if they say you're over covering or over darkening, nine times out of ten, the tongue's probably being pulled back a bit which is closing off some of that space, okay? I'm gonna try to, I closed the book, but I'm gonna try to open it back up again here for you. So, mm, so if this guy gets pulled back, right? You just closed off a fair amount of pharyngeal space, okay? And things, yes, it might sound a little darker, but you've sacrificed a lot of the air column that's going to give a lot of the depth to your voice and a lot of the richness, a lot of the, um, a lot of harmonics are gonna get activated and also likely you're dampening out some of the singer's formant. Because if you recall from one of my videos, singer's formant is thought to be mitigated in this smaller like superglottic area that's right here because it's a small space, right? So if you're squeezing off up here and creating a smaller space there, some of these high harmonics might get dampened out from that action, maybe. Not with all singers, but it might. Um, they might be able to regain some of it by maybe lowering the soft palate a bit and creating more of a nasal sound. And that kind of happens sometimes with, like I, I probably hear it most prevalently with young tenors. <laughs> when they get a little too, it's like in the nose instead of through the nose and pingy. They tend to be doing a little bit of that, but then they also have this, I'm a tenor, so I need to sound a bit like this. And they get a little, you know, sound, and it's like, no, that's not quite the ideal sound, right? That's not like a professionally viable sound. Um, it's a little almost Kermit the Frogish sound instead, which, sorry, young tenors, I know that's like a thing that happens, right? And some of you out there might have been that tenor, you might still be that tenor, and you might know that tenor who's kind of Kermit the Frogish, right? And it's like, what are they doing? Well, they're probably pulling the root of the tongue back a bit to to create an artificial darkening of their sound. And then to regain some of that singer's formant, they're probably trying to put some of it like in the nasal, they're probably driving a bit into the nasal passages in terms of um, the acoustic energy. There's, there's maybe a little too much going in there, so a little hypernasal along with that. Um, but essentially pulling the root of the tongue back, when I say artificially darkening, what the problem is is as a singer, Inside your own head, if you pull the root of the tongue back, you think you sound awesome, right? Like, you're like, oh yeah, you know, I need to sound like 
like Renee Fleming singing the Countess or whatever, okay? So, <laughs> right? So then I was just like, we put it in the world. Right? And I felt like if you saw my tip of my tongue couldn't even reach the teeth because I was pulling back so much, right? And you think you sound amazing. You're like, oh my God, I sound just like, you know, oh, I could do Costa Diva and sound just like Collis, right? Like, Costa Diva, right? Like, I think I sound amazing. But in reality, I have no singer's formant. I've got no feeling of ping here. Nothing happening in the mask area, okay? All that's gone. I sound husky. There's like too much breathiness coming through my voice, okay? And if I do it, I don't know what it's gonna sound like on this because microphones will, you know, kind of help dampen out some of that huskiness and I might sound really good through a microphone, but I have no carrying power. That sound would never carry over an orchestra. I do not have a big enough voice to push that out through an orchestra because I don't have the resonance to do it. I'm sunk, can't do it wouldn't hear me in my middle voice, even on the lightest orchestration. Also, uh, not feasible for me to take that sound up higher in my voice. And I'm a high coloratura, so like, you know, I can't use a sound in the middle of voice and then not be able to take it up, okay? That's just not functional. Also, biggest problem with that is, now that I've got all that going on, if I wanted to continue having that sound and then make a singer's format, I gotta do some funky stuff. And the net effect of all of that, with the root of the tongue being pulled back like that, is that I'm compromising, my laryngeal function is now not so easy. Now I have a smaller airspace above, which means I need higher subglottal pressure to, remember the subglottal and superglottal pressures have to be balanced on like a seesaw. They keep kind of rock, they kind of go, like this one goes high and then this one goes low when your voice is vibrating. If you remember that from my larynx video, my laryngeal function video. Um, uh, so w the net effect of all of this is, okay, so now I've taken my seesaw and because like, let's say this is my superglottic side, okay? And this is the subglottic side. All right, so at rest, just hanging out. Now I want a voice. So now I pull the base of the tongue back. So superglottic air pressure is gonna go a little higher because I've made my pharyngeal space a little smaller, okay? And then now subglottic, you know, needs to really work a lot harder to overcome that and push its way through the vocal folds to keep them in vibration. So now I need more air pressure going through the vocal folds. I have more vocal fold contact, but I'm not really getting a lot of benefit from that. I'm getting not as much, I wouldn't have an ability to do a softer voice, a pianissimo that would carry, that wouldn't be possible. I'd have to basically be staying singing at a forte or louder. Okay, uh, to just be heard. If I kept doing that, you know, okay. And I would need to be taking huge breaths and likely I would still run out of air by the end of my phrase. If I was doing something like Costa Diva or Por de Amor with these long phrases, which are not in my repertoire, they're not arias I would ever sing on my own, but um, I would run out of air because I got all that huskiness coming. I've got all this like, Air is escaping through my vocal folds. Like, ugh, it's just kind of a little bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a mess. I've created a bit of a mess by trying to sound like, by trying to darken my voice to the point where I would sound in my head like a Renee Fleming or like a Maria Collis or something. I would sound like one of those big dark voices. And I'm not one of those voices. So that's the issue. I'd be trying to sing like someone else. I'm creating this over darkened sound. You know, like, yeah, it sounds so rich and dark and lovely. But I can't even do a good E because I've got it pulled back too far. Um, and I couldn't, I don't think I would have the stamina to sing through a whole opera like that. You know, to do like a two hour whatever, especially at my age, because I can't recoup from the fatigue that would probably settle in because my vocal ease has been compromised. The ease of vocal production, it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm having to do a lot down there. I'm having to push. I'm having to really drive the subglottic pressure to keep my voice in vibration and to try to make it through, you know, cross your fingers, try to make it through a phrase. So I know root of the tongue is a thing that a lot of classical singers feel are quite the nemesis. 
I feel like it's almost a bigger deal with people who have big voices and are told they have big voices at a young age and people who are like lower voices. So like mezzo sopranos, um, pos you know, baritones can kind of fall into this a bit. Um, basses for sure, you know, but people who are expecting a dark sound for the voice type. And when you're young, um, you think you need to hear that darkness in your head. You don't need to hear the darkness. That's the answer to the root of the tongue tension, okay? If you're a big voice, it means your voice just comes out big. It doesn't mean you have to make it big. You don't have to show off how big it is. You just have to take an inhale and sing with ease and it's gonna sound loud. It might not sound loud in your head and that's okay. Similarly, if you're a mezzo-soprano or a baritone out there, you have a richer tone to your voice, maybe more of a, like a contralto tone even perhaps, rare voice types, but they do exist. Um, you know, if you're more of those sort of voices, then you, you know, if you create this over darkened sound, you sound really dark and rich in your head, right? You're going to be like, oh man, I'm sounding so good. I'm sounding so like a mezzo soprano. I'm sounding wonderful. But actually outside of your head, you sound like you're kind of singing through like someone stuffed your mouth with cotton, right? Like I always call it like the singing through a sock thing. And it happens sometimes with lyrical tenors, tenors who are getting into the Buccini rep and they're starting to sing this really big rep, say like in graduate school or something, they might start getting that sound where they sound really great when they first come in and they're a lighter voice. But now that they're trying to sing this heavier rep with this darker tone, all of a sudden the tongue's starting to be pulled back a bit and they get that like, it's like they're singing through, like they kind of sound like they're in a tunnel, you know? Like it's kind of that like, huh, they're only 10 feet away, but they sound like they're much further away. <laughs> Right? Like they're not that loud. They're not carrying that well. And that ring really isn't coming to the back of this, you know, hall or whatever. Um, it kind of sounds like they're singing through like a sock, like they have something stuffed in their mouth. Um, and that's kind of the overcovered sound. And nine times out of 10, I think, and I've seen and I've experienced as a voice teacher, a lot of times it's from trying to make your voice sound different than it does. Trying to make a vocal quality that's dark and rich and lovely inside your head. But the biggest key as a singer, whether you're a belter or a classical singer, is you don't get to enjoy your own sound. You just get to enjoy how easy it is to make the sound. But you don't get to sit there and be like, I love how dark my voice is. Because in your head, you're not going to hear dark. You're probably going to hear and feel the pingy, riggy, that really obnoxious, like super big kind of part of your voice. That's what you're you're gonna hear when you sing most of the time. So, sorry folks. So if you have rooted the tongue tension, you can stretch out your tongue, absolutely. If it's been there for a long time, stretching out the tongue forward can really help you disassociate the, the sensation, okay? Can give you a better sense for what the back of your tongue is doing and help you get that sensation that it needs to be pulled back kind of out of the way. Um, so it can help with that a little bit. Um, but a lot of it is reconsider, you know, realize that if somebody said, oh, you have root of the tongue tension or base of the tongue tension, sometimes singers call it base instead of root. Um, you call it that and you're like, oh, you know, you need to go work on that in the practice room. Realize the sound inside your head is gonna change. So you're gonna wanna take a recording in. You're gonna wanna listen to yourself. You're going to hate it, but you're going to want to do it because you're really going to want to tell when it feels better, what does it actually sound like on a recording? Because in your head, it probably sounds worse when it feels better. When it feels easier here, you'll probably think the sound in your head is worse and you'll think they're crazy that they think that's a good sound. They're completely nuts. And they're not actually. It's just the way it works. Sorry, guys. I will, I think, do a video on like how we hear ourselves in our head a little bit because there's a little bit of science behind it and it's always a bit of a mystery uh, for singers and it's probably one of the hardest things to get used to is the fact that what you hear in your head is very deceptive. So don't try to darken your voice. Don't try to create darkness in the sound quality in terms of what you hear. Um, check out the lowering the larynx video using more of your breath, using those low, large inhales that really expand out your rib cage to the point, all the way to the point where the clavicle starting to release a little bit down, even like a few millimeters. And that's very tiny. Okay, guys, like in US and you don't really know metric very well. I'm in the US too, I know. Um, but you know, it might move just the tiniest bit, but even the tiniest bit, a couple millimeters is enough to create that darker sound by having a passively lowered larynx. 
So if the clavicle starts to release down because you took a really big released inhale, then you have some of those connections from your larynx down into that clavicular area and that sternum that are starting to pull the larynx down naturally. Um, and that's probably the best way to get that darker sound because then you have a slightly longer pharyngeal space rather than a compressed one that's still creating that artificially darkened. Artificial, you know, it's like, it's not really artificial because it's real and you're making it and you're making it with your voice, but it's artificial in the sense that it's just not professionally viable. Like casting directors won't trust that you can really make it through a role like that. So, all right, folks, that's it for the root of the tongue. Sorry, it's a little bit of a long video, but the tongue just is like that sometimes. It's complicated. All right, so up next, we're going to talk a little bit about pure vowels because that's important to get into, especially for classical singers who are going to be singing in languages that are not ones that they speak uh, either fluently or very readily. Okay, all right, and you're wondering, well, the biggest difference for singers, you're trying to sound like a native speaker. It's a whole different bag of tricks than just talking in the language, right? All right. So see you guys there next time. Bye.